Oh, sorry, I think I took your mic. Oh, thank you. Uh, so a little, a little bit about the panelists. Um, so Sonal was is a principal at Tao Ventures, and they invest in early stage AI startups in healthcare, enterprise, and automation. Uh, she's had a successful career in M&A, evaluating multi-billion dollar deals with Fortune 500 companies in India. She was previously chief of staff at Cygnos and holds an MBA from Wharton. And she's also an avid photographer going to remote parts of the world and taking really cool pictures. Um, and Raed is a founding partner of Transform. Uh, he's a seasoned entrepreneur with 20x outcomes and three failures. Uh, which turned him into a VC later on, and an institutional LP. Ride played a key role in wireless policy innovation and introduced in-flight internet through Jaguar Wireless and SkySurf. Now he's based in Silicon Valley. He's co-founded Mubdala Ventures and established Transform. He holds an MBA from Cornell, and Transform typically invests in deep tech and impact companies. Um, so... I think to start us off, um, what what uh, what emerging technologies and applications has you both the most excited in 2024? Ladies first. I'm gonna go ahead and say AI. <laughs> well, in our case, uh, what we're really excited by is you know we started as an AI first fund back in 2019, um, and with our team, um, you know we've all been engineers, founders, or builders. And um, we're really excited that with Gen AI, little more than a year ago, it's actually brought AI to the mainstream and it's accelerated adoption, um, a lot of these uh, technologies out there. Um, so within AI, you know, what we focus on is digital health enterprise and automation. Um, on the enterprise side, been seeing a lot of tools like sales uh, enablement tools, things to make um, sales executives more efficient. Um, you know, I think what's really cool Cool about um, the field that we're in and also, you know, where we are just geographically is the base of innovation. And so there's always scope for just like learning and getting up to speed. And uh, one of the recent areas we've been looking at is voice AI. Um, we've made one investment um, in a digital health company uh, in that space last year. Uh, but of course, everyone's been seeing, you know, the news of uh, the latest companies in the space. So that's one that we're tracking. Um, another that we get excited by um, is also just in the clinical trial space. Um, because that's a process that has like so many inefficiencies. Um, and so we're excited with AI um, kind of shortening that whole cycle and also reducing a lot of costs there. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Raid. Great. So I'm going to say, is this, is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So I will say AI with impact. All right. Oftentimes, um, uh, founders start building things, solving problems. Great. And they only start thinking about giving back once they're millionaires or billionaires. Well, at Transform, we say, we, we, we say no. Uh, as part of our initial investments, we ask our founders, and we put this in our side letter, to pick one impact measure, just one, that, uh, that a founder could measure from day number one, even if it's zero for a while or even a long while. It doesn't matter, so long as it's top of mind, so that they're thinking about giving back and being impactful to the world. We measure impact in three different ways, one or three different layers. One, we look at the entrepreneur themselves. Are they uh, underrepresented? Do they, uh, do they come from a disadvantaged group of some sort? Then we look at their hiring practices. Are they hiring people that are disadvantaged or come from a minority or underrepresented group? And third, we look at the business outcome. So whatever that product or solution, does it make that expensive cheap? Does it, does it you know, enable a, a community group or underrepresented group to be more empowered? Um, so those are the areas we think uh, Silicon Valley is going to start turning its attention to is impact along with tech. Awesome. So I think 2023 was a cold splash of water in every founder's face when they went to go raise money. I know it was for me when I was trying to raise money last year, where typical uh, meetings and due diligence times seemed what typically would take three to four meetings to go get a check, we're taking five, six, seven, eight, indefinitely. And uh, it, was a, it was a huge headache for us. And so my question would be, do you expect due diligence times to decrease in 2024 as they were comparatively to 2023 and recently? Sure, I'll start. I mean, yesterday I was approached by a, uh, this SaaS startup that has AI that will do my work for me. So 
if I adopt such a solution, then yes, it will be much quicker. Uh, that being said, it's um, uh, Silicon Valley is going through an interesting times at the moment where it's not as founder friendly as it's been in the past. So the what used to be a lot of momentum investing, momentum investing is that lots of things happening. You just want to get into the deal. Uh, that happened in you know nine, 2019 until maybe 21. Uh, that's over time has been um, less the case. Therefore, uh, I guess VCs have been taking their time to really pick the best companies that align with their interests and their criteria and so forth. So uh, a long winded way to say, I, I don't think um, diligence times will be shorter. I think it will be longer, uh, but it might become more efficient with the use of AI. I would kind of second your thoughts there. Um, not going to decrease at least um, this year, unfortunately. Um, I think, you know, there are a couple of factors here at play, right? Like one is supply of capital, which gives um, VCs more leverage in this case over founders. Um, and, um, you know, them just being um, really mindful about where uh, we're investing uh, in this year. So, um, unfortunately, in I guess on average, uh, the due diligence times are going to stay more or less the same as last year. Um, but to the other point, also, um, you know, it's it's interesting how we as investors are trying to invest in the next wave of innovation, and one of them is going to be AI that replaces VCs. Uh, but we do see that happening further down, so in growth or later stage, where there's more data points um, at the seed stage, at the pre-seed. Um, you know, it's about the founding team, it's about the technology. It's about, um, you know, having that vision of where the market is going and whether there's a uh, fit for it in the uh, near to short, near to medium uh, time frame. Um, so thankfully, I think as early stage investors, uh, some of us are a little more secure. Uh, but, you know, it's definitely going to help um, down the line along the growth stage. Well, there you go. You got to be a little bit more on it. Um, I would like to add, though, that Silicon Valley, in our opinion, remains to be kind of the best place to build a startup in the world. Uh, Silicon Valley happens to be a bit more insular than other places. So we've started a, an initiative and a movement called impactabillion.com, if you want to check it out. Um, impactabillion.com, which where we take Silicon Valley and a roadshow to the inner cities of America and Canada. I'm Canadian, so we got to always include. Uh, where we identify overlooked, underrepresented founders, bring the Silicon Valley rigor to them, help them crack the valley in weeks instead of years. So we love events like this and Founders Village uh, because it allows us to see entrepreneurs not from Silicon Valley generally who are trying to tap into it. And that's exactly the, the kind of talent that we think um, us and Tao and others can, if we can help you crack the valley in weeks instead of years, then we've done our job right. Yeah, as an LA transplant, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, this place is eons above any other ecosystem I've ever experienced. So if there's any way you can make your way to the Valley if you're out of this ecosystem, I highly recommend it. There's no place in the world like it. I gotta ask you though, because I know this is a question that's gonna come up. Um, did you make the move to help with fundraising and has that helped with the fundraise? Actually, yeah, I did. I, I made the move um, from Southern California's ecosystem up here, um, and it was primarily for fundraising, and it was the best decision I've made. Uh, the access to capital, and not to mention the the bullishness of the investors up here, it's it's really different from any other ecosystem. You'd you'd spend what what people experience here with those long diligence times was. 10x down south and much less capital and uh, the their, the mentality of those investors are, are pretty different than they are in in the valley and um, not to mention when you come up here and you're with so many other extremely smart people you just you start feeding off of each other and and you, everybody's energy levels are up here and uh, like I said I've never experienced any other place like it um, so so the next question I have is, how is the looming threat of a potential recession affecting investment activity? Um, I can take this one. So in our case, um, we're fortunate that we closed our fund in April of last year. So we still have a good 
two years of, uh, you know, deployment left. So uh, not affecting us as much as, you know, a lot of the other firms that have been negatively hit by this. But what we see in the market is that um, a lot of firms are being more mindful about their capital allocation, about where they're allocating their funds to uh, reserves. So for their follow on investments versus actually making new investments, um, we've come across uh, firms kind of modifying their strategy and deciding, OK, you know, we're going to be very bullish on, say, the top like 10 percent which is um, likely going to return our fund and, um, you know, we'll actually let the other uh, companies die, unfortunately. Um, so we've come across firms that have taken a more, um, I guess, a more, you could say, like militant approach to this. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, we have firms also deciding that we're only going to double down. Um, we're going to wait for our next fund um, to close. And once that next fund is closed, then we're going to deploy more capital um, into new companies. So I'll say that the, um, the, asset, the VC asset class in general is really quite interesting. And particularly in the early stage, the stage you guys are playing, you men and ladies are playing in, is, is quite insulated from the macro. Uh, happenings. Yes, we have, um, you know, uh, potentially a, a, a depression, all these interest rate issues and so forth. But um, essentially in the early stage at the pre-seed, at the seed, whatever you're building is such of such high risk and uh, that it's, you know, most likely than not, it's, it's going to be unsuccessful, of course. But it's going to take very few of you to work really hard, real smart to um, take the company where it needs to go. So, so long as you're solving for something um, that truly needs to be solved and you're doing a great job, you're doing it 10 times better than anyone else, then you're going to find that there is capital for you. Uh, I would be less concerned about the macro climate and all that. And as, of course, as you progress and you're building your product, you get through product market fit, you show traction, you have the data, you'll find that VCs at the Series A and the Series B are going to be very happy to back you. And by the time you get to the Series B or C, the you know the market macro conditions will have bounced back. In which case, you know you become billionaires and make us, you know, people, make make us make us make us millionaires when you become billionaires. That's how VC works. Yeah. All right. Um, so with that in mind, uh, do either of you expect any changes to the criteria that investors have? Um, for startup funding in 2024? And if so, what would they be? No. <laughs> All right. It's, listen, we look for founders that are um, frugal, that are resourceful, that can get a lot done on very little. So uh, if a founder is wasteful, well, you know, wastefulness scales really well. You know? <laughs> so if, if you're wasteful with $100, guess what? You know, if I give you a million, you're going to waste it even quicker. Yeah. So we look, we pay attention, and investors like us, we like to invest in lines, not in dots. So when we meet a founder, that's a dot. Have a second meeting, that's a second dot. We can draw a line. Have a third meeting, a longer line. So we look at also, do the founders do the same things, do the things they say they're going to do? Do they show up on time? Do they over tip at restaurants? All these little things add up to give us a worldview about that founder and, you know, their ability, their willingness, their, how they work with their co-founders and so forth. So it really comes back to team. So this is, has always been a criteria for, I think, the best VCs like Tao and us. And uh, this is no different. So that's, I, I gave you that no, but I, I think it's helpful to elaborate. Um, I'd say that with, um, yeah, with, you know, just how things are changing, in our case at least, uh, the criteria doesn't change. Again, because of the seed stage, it's mostly about the team. Um, but what we do see at slightly later stages is um, just VCs looking for more data points, more proof points on execution. Um, before the Series A, you know, you could have an ARR of one million and raise a pretty good uh, Series A. Now you're expected to have something closer, like three to five. I mean, of course, it depends on your particular industry and what you're building for. Um, but you know, more traction is what VCs look for. Um, and that's kind of bled down a little earlier on also. Um, so of course, in our case, in the pre-seed, you know, there is really isn't any traction. So that's kind of a moot point. But um, at the seed also, we're seeing, um, you know, more firms just looking um, for those proof points of execution. All right. So if you ever take a VC to dinner, make sure not to get the filet mignon and tip 20%. All right. 
That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. The true that. Yes, well, please, <laughs> please apply uh, to our VC. <laughs> um, so, what challenges and opportunities do early stage startups face in the current fundraising climate, and how can they position themselves for success? Well, I think one of the things that I mentioned is this is a bit of a long game. So, you know, you don't, you shouldn't go to a VC and expect things to turn around in one month. There are very few founders, uh, maybe at the top 10th percentile, um, who are able to close their rounds like remarkably quickly, um, especially if they're repeat founders, um, sometimes even if they're not. Um, but with most people, you know, what we suggest is keep conversations ongoing. Um, you know, if you're looking to raise, um, of course, you should be having these conversations, but well in advance, um, you know, try to pick VC's brains on advice. Um, you've probably all heard, you know, if you ask for advice, you get money and the other way around. Um, there was one investment like that that we did last year where we came across them. We don't typically participate too much in pre-seed, but, um, you know, got in touch with the founder, um, really liked what they're doing and we're going to keep warm for the future. Um, and then a couple of months later, you know, he pinged me, he was going to be in SF. Uh, and so we met at TechCrunch Disrupt. Um, and then he kept sending me these investor newsletters. He didn't really ask me to be on it. And of course, I didn't mind. Um, but that helped me see how he was so proactive in terms of his outreach with other investors. And it's kind of playing this game, right, where you're not really asking for money, but at the same time, you're kind of pitching yourself. Um, so I think it's, it's really critical for founders to um, kind of learn how to play that long game compared to, you know, just raise when you're raising. Um, and, you know, in terms of challenge, um, there's going to, there's always going to be really great companies around. Um, so, you know, you have to figure out how do you develop those relationships because at the end of the day, um, you know, it also does boil down to relationships, especially when you're just starting out in the Bay Area, when you don't really have a lot of those relationships to start with. So I'm going to echo much of what uh, Sono said. I'll regurgitate in my own way. So for starters, everyone pull out your phone, and there's a book you all have to read. It's called Fundraising by Ryan Breslow. How original. So uh, Ryan Breslow is a good friend of ours, an equity partner of ours. He's wrote a book. I would say it's worth its weight in gold, but it's really a very thin book. So it's, weight, it's worth much more than its weight in gold. And it's, uh, the audio version is only 15 minutes, so you, you can cover it very quickly. Um, so I encourage everyone here to get that book, listen to it, read it. Ryan Breslow um, fundraising. So the book is orange or red or something. Yeah. So, uh, and you know what Ryan says, and, and this is really kind of best practices. The best thing you should do when you're um, building relationships with VC, the first word that should come out of your mouth is, I'm not fundraising. Okay. The nice thing when you're not fundraising, no one can say no. <laughs> but someone can say yes if they really like what you're doing. And the idea is to continue building those dots, having those non-fundraising meetings. Um, and then uh, at some point, once you've signed up this big customer account or you've accomplished something really quite interesting that deserves um, to have around, or if someone says yes unexpectedly, that, that could actually be a trigger as well. Then you talk with everyone else with whom you had just been not fundraising and say, oh, this thing happened. So you create momentum around that round, and then you can create a round. And, 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 and one of the mistakes founders do is they always try to shoot for a big round. And when you shoot for a big round, that makes you less scarce. But if it's a small round, um, what happens is that VCs are going to start, if they're like you, of course, and like the company, they're going to say, oh, well, can you let me in? And then you can do, the, do them the favor of expanding the round, as, a, as opposed to you asking for a big number and not getting there. So if you really want three million, raise one. And if someone says, oh, I really want like this, I want to put more, say, well, okay, fine, I'll do you the favor. Or maybe you'll raise more money at a higher cap or something. So, but you're kind of con in control of the, the process. But the, um, read the book. There's so much wisdom in there. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, great, great point, actually. Because um, I know in our case, we raised a relatively small round um, and then oversubscribed. And that says a lot more than you know, trying to raise a large round and, and struggling to, to fill that up. You know, we raised 500 and uh, went up to 550K um, oversubscribed. And so 
it, it really sends a good message out there that your, your shares are in demand. <laughs> um, so we're kind of running out of time here. So and I know you have to get going soon. Um, so what key advice do you have for entrepreneurs seeking funding in 2024? Everything I just said. <laughs> there you go. I would add to that uh, with what Armand did and what we've seen a couple of our founders do and what we've advised them. Um, you know, it's great to be scrappy. It's great to have teams in uh, remote locations, especially if you don't really need them to be in person. You know, you're cutting down on a lot of burn that way. And uh, it's important to, you know, even today, like raise with, say, 12 to 18 months runway at the very least. Um, at, but to that point, uh, you know, it really helps when the CEO is in a place such as Silicon Valley or like New York or any other place uh, in, on the East Coast um, because it's it's you know it's one thing after another uh, after another like there are so many events that happen um, you know get into as many of them as you can because you never know where a conversation can click um, you know when you're speaking with an investor if it doesn't work out your way or even if it does um, at the end of the conversation ask them you know do you is there anyone you suggest that we chat with or is there any introduction that you can make for us um, introductions are a little bit tricky if a VC hasn't committed yet um, but you know you can always ask for names if you don't um, you know if you're if you're still looking for like more VCs to work with. Yeah, I'd like to add that, um, and this is a mistake I made frequently as a uh, founder myself, is I would think the VC is the most important target for me. And the, the truth is no. The most important human for you is your user or your customer. So be obsessed with them. Um, don't go in like a dungeon somewhere, build and, you know, build this vision in your mind and you thought, oh, the user is going to love this. No, get out there. It's okay if you're embarrassed with your product. Get out there, get the feedback. If you can get them to part ways with their money, that means you're doing something good. Uh, maybe, and if they're not, then maybe you're not. So you adjust. You. And, and just know that VCs follow users. VCs follow customers. Uh, that's because oftentimes you would pitch us an idea that we really don't know much. We don't know if it's a good idea or a bad idea. But the best signal we can get is, oh, well, this is what my users are saying. Or better yet, this is what my users are paying. And that's the signal that VCs want to hear so that they can say, okay, I, don't, I still don't understand what they do, but someone with money is willing to pay for it. Okay, I'm going to take a bet on this. Yeah, great, great advice. And actually to the, to the point of the customer, uh, being customer centric, uh, during our investor calls, we actually would bring in our, our customer to come in and talk about why they needed the product and why they're willing to pay for it. And that's really what allowed us to raise this money so so quickly was when the CEO of another company is willing to jump on a call to talk about how much they need the product, that, that speaks volumes. Um, so yeah, um, I think uh, Sonal, you might have to get going, but we sh would like to do a short Q&A um, if anybody has any questions. Um, Thanks. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, but if you have any questions for Ryan, um, what's your name? Um, I'm Sufyan Abdel. I'm the CEO. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, I'm your Sufyan. name again, please. For yeah, the I'm microphone. Sufyan. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm the CEO of a company called Retinol, and we prevent blindness due to an eye disease called AMD. That's amazing. I'm sorry. One sec. I, uh, we can't hear him. Yes. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So I'm Sufyan, I'm the CEO of Retinov. It's a, a French company that will now be based here in San Francisco to prevent blindness due to a disease called AMD or macular degeneration. So it's a deep tech slash med tech company. And uh, you were talking about uh, don't raise a lot of money, like start by asking like 500 Ks maybe or like a million, even though you are looking for more. I tried that and what I've been told is that like, I'm not credible enough. Like when you ask for little money, especially for that kind of companies, then people say that I don't know what I'm talking about, and then I'm underestimating my uh, my needs, and it means that I don't have the right vision. So that's why, like, I'm, I want to agree with you, but so I'm going to say first of all, this may or may not be true that you're credible or not credible. So you got to understand what gives you credibility in your field. Is it um, having an advisor? Is it having some sort of paper that's published? 
So I don't know your field very well, but, and by the way, all of you who are interested in fundraising, you're welcome to uh, submit a founder form on our website, go transform.vc slash founders. We wanna hear from you. Um, so it's, it's obviously case specific. So uh, you have to understand what gives credibility to your startup. So, um, uh, you know, we can take it offline, but that's, that's essentially the area. What I encourage you to spend time thinking about. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Haley. I'm founding very early stage, early, early, early stage, a company called Bubble. Um, we're like Airbnb for sharing houses. And um, isn't that what Airbnb is? No, this is peer to peer. So this is someone else rents a house. Swapping on Airbnb. Homes. No, no, no. Mm. Okay, this is. Someone rents a house on Airbnb and they bring it to my platform and then they, then they can break up the rooms and rent the rooms. Mm. Or they could get the house from anywhere. We don't care where they get the house. It could be a tent. Um, the question is, I'm at the, I'm a, not a non-technical founder. I'm looking for a technical founder, co-founder. And um, so I'm at a, a fork right now where I probably got a little bit of incorrect advice. And there's the question of build a low-code, no-code MVP or start building product and get, a fit, you know, it'll cost three times as much, so the quote says. So which way would you go? I'm hoping yeah. you're going to say what well, I... Well, what I have a question. Is this... Uh, so this reminds me of one of my early startups where I used to have a website called SalonCanada.com, lay yellow pages for hair salons. One day, a, um, a hairdresser who used to pay me $20 a month calls and says, right, this thing isn't working. So just being the stubborn guy that I am, I took out his number, I put my cell phone instead. And my phone starts ringing with all these customers calling, hi, I'd like to get a color and a cut. So I'd say, sure, I'll call you back. I would call the salon, find an opening, call her. So I just built a, like a, a manual solution to prove this out. Mm -hmm. And then once I've delivered, I don't know, tens of calls like these, bringing thousands of dollars, are you like, okay, how can I automate? So I wonder if this is something you could do, is just do this completely manual, show the traction, and use that traction to induce technical founders to join you, or even better investors, and then you can hire those technical chops to build the automation. So something to consider. So, so you don't recommend, a, I've already architected a low-code solution, but you say don't go low-code for a well, split second. I'm, I'm saying try both. Try both, okay. The idea is, again, focus on the user and the traction. Yeah. Don't just stay still, oh, I'm not going to do anything until oh, I no, get a CTO. We have started, I'm fully in it. I'm trying to get yeah. out of an agreement and just go low-code. That's what I mean. Like I've gone down a path of not low-code, of real with app? Low code, no code, doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. Okay, what matters is the customer traction. Yeah. If you can you. get that somehow, yes. then you can point to something. Someone's willing to pay for this. Yep. Then for a sure. whole bunch of people are going to come to you. Thank Co you. Co founders, investors, more customers. Yeah. I've been doing it for 10 years anyway on the side myself. That's why I did it. But there yeah. you go. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Um, good morning. My name is Zia. I am the co-founder of a, a startup called Revlix. So we're essentially building a Yelp for, for nonprofit um, organizations with features of OpenTable and GoFundMe. So we help the nonprofit organizations to match more um, uh, uh, volunteers and donations Ooh. on an individual level or cooperation level. So we already built our um, MVP two months ago, and right now we built like over 30 partnerships with nonprofit uh, organizations in San Francisco Bay Area. So my question is, what kind of traction um, are you looking for for pre-seed? Because right now we're, we're pre-revenue, because it just felt like hard to uh, tell them like at this level, this stage, we want to charge you already. So we just you know commit to like, we want to grow with you together. Sure. It's, it's mostly about the vision and, you know, the th sort of things you've accomplished. So we look at three things. We think to build really uh, companies that uh, generate outlier impact and outlier financial returns. We believe there are kind of there's three key ingredients. One is some sort of a deep tech, um, AI, complex engineering, material sciences, something like that. Two, and really is the most important thing, is the network effect. So a marketplace so is a network effect. There are 16 different type of network effects. They're not all created equal. Go to nfx.com and read up on this is very, very important. And the last is that 10x advantage. If whatever you're building is not 10 times better than anything else, then customers will not leave what they have to come to you. So at the pre-seed, you want to articulate these things well and show as much evidence of, of that as much as possible. 
and um, and just do all the things, build the relationships, do the not fundraising, you know, and then you land someone who who who's um, who might align with with your narrative. So uh, that's what I would say. Thank you. Of course. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to give a, a recommendation to every founder. I, I like the recommendation of fundraising. There's a new a book by Jerry Newman and Elizabeth Zauman. Jerry is a founder of New Capital. It's called Founder versus Investor. And it's beautiful because uh, Jerry is the investor of Elizabeth and they disagree on every page. So it's really, really, really insightful. But I have a question. So the question is, what is the one investment, successful or not as successful as you thought it would have been, that you're still proud of telling the story about today and why you're still proud of it. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm proud of all my investments. They're, it's like my kids. <laughs> Talk about them forever. Uh, the one that kind of stands out a little bit is a company called Ample, only because it's a Silicon Valley company that uh, we're the only Silicon Valley investor in. Uh, it's been really an undarling. Everyone's thought it was a bad idea, and you know it's proving out to be a great idea. Uh, so Ample provides full electric energy to any EV, in under five minutes. And they have a compelling business model where they charge zero upfront, they only charge a fee per mile. So they make more money per Uber car than Uber. And um, it's, you know, since we've invested, we've been followed by Shell Energy, Blackstone, other big names all outside of the valley. So we're pretty excited about that one. But, you know, we're equally excited about all our kids. So my name is Ahmad. I'm from Germany. So I just moved here recently because I know this is the place to be. So I just built up my startup, but in, I'm in a transition. So I came to the idea, okay, if I'm in Germany having a transition, why still do it in Germany? Much better to come to SF. So basically my question is, because I'm solopreneur up to now, is about co-founders and equity share. How should it be split? from the beginning or in the middle? What is your opinion or your experience? Yeah, My opinion is if it's not obvious, if, it, if the split is not obvious, then go 50-50 or equal. If you're four or 25 each and so forth. If it's obvious, then it's obvious. And that's worked really well because, um, uh, of course, uh, if someone ends up not pulling their weight or so forth, then you need to have mechanics in place to take the shares back or, or have it vest over time and so forth. But that's my advice is, is just go for equal because there are like many say written things about like CEO has to have one percentage more two percentage more and stuff well, and this well, is what well, it are makes you, like are you referring to co-founders or you're referring to executives so co-founders is different right if you if you're starting on day one some guy is a ceo the other is a ceo it doesn't matter you're all gonna do everything anyways from the beginning yeah equal and if it's so one it, ha month, it has yeah. to be commensurate with effort and risk okay okay effort and risk exactly so think of those two things are they taking the same risk as you are they putting in the same effort as you if yes and yes 50 50. yeah to do that exactly what i think yeah but, I, I but mean, think of risk are they are like are they putting money more money than you then then that needs to be compensated so maybe that portion of the money can be treated as an, an investment at a, a lower safe than even us. Okay? So that may end up being 52, 48. But really, on the common share, will it be 50, 50. You just have two extra as a preferred because you're an investor for that 20K that you put in. Okay, thank you.